Hi, uh, good morning or technically afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I feel. Um, so I'm going to talk about improving container image registry availability with Cube Image Keeper, also known as Quick. That's a really long title. <laughs> um, so. By the way, the slides, well, as you probably have noticed on the SCED website, you can access the slides, but just in case, if you want to access the slides as well, there is a QR code in the corner. Uh, the QR code is also going to be visible during the rest of the talk. So if you see interesting links or whatever in my slides and want to follow the links or copy paste comments or whatever, uh, you're absolutely welcome to. Uh, first, before I introduce myself, I have a few questions for you. Uh, who here is using Kubernetes? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, who here ever had like registry issues? Okay, well, I understand why you're here. Uh, who is here mostly because they're interested by Kube Builder? Almost no one, okay. Uh, and just out of curiosity, who here is uh, self-employed or freelancer? Uh, just, okay, like me, and uh, was also speaking at conferences in the freelancers, uh, okay? Int so for folks who are freelance and speaking at conferences, it would be interesting to discuss after because I'm still trying to find out how to put everything together. Uh, and by the way, I would like to give a huge thanks to the Linux Foundation and to Enix, uh, a French company, who both helped me a lot to be here. Because uh, back when I was working at Docker years ago, uh, Docker was basically paying me to go and speak at conferences. Now that I'm a freelancer, well, I mean, I'm technically paying myself to speak at conferences, but it leaves my right pocket to go in the left pocket, so that doesn't quite work. Anyway, um, so today uh, we're going to talk about this thing called Cube Image Keeper or Quick. Uh, we try to make it pronounced like Quick with a soft U, but since uh, I, I think for English speakers that's just weird, we settled on Quick. Uh, so I'm going to explain how it works, why we even wrote it, compare it to other options, and then I'm going to talk a bit about Cube Builder as well. And there's going to be a ton of demos uh, and so I think uh, one thing I should do is um, eat a grape. So back when I was working at Docker uh, there was a, a Spanish team with uh, Borja and Fernando and what they did before live demos is that they would eat a piece of grape. I don't know if it was a Spanish thing or completely related but I think it can't hurt. So there is for the demo gods just in case. Um, so first why Quick, why QB Mesh Keeper? Mm. Most of you raised your hands when we asked about who's using Kubernetes, so I, I'm sure you already know that problem very well, but just in case, so Kubernetes clusters uh, run containers, that's their whole point, and containers uh, use container images, and so before you can run a container, you need to download the container image from what we call a registry. So these registries, for instance, there is the Docker Hub, there is Quay, you can run your own registry, etc. And a registry is just an HTTP server, like serving blobs, that's it. Um, but sometimes registry don't work the way they were meant to work. For instance, back in April, we had a super embarrassing outage uh, at, I think it was uh, Google Cloud EU West 9, which is a fancy way to say uh, Paris. There was some fire and some flood and stuff happening. And so long story short, um, the registry.key8s.io wasn't available for hours, I think almost an entire day, and not just for customers of Google Cloud, but for pretty much everyone in uh, Western Europe. So that was kind of a, of a big deal. Sometimes images can also be deleted from a registry. You might wonder why would that happen? Why would someone go and delete an image? Well, images can be fairly big. It's pretty common to have images of multiple gigabytes. And so if you go DevOps and ship five times a day, maybe you're shipping a, a huge image five times a day and it just adds up on your registry. And unless you have infinite disk storage or infinite money to pay for S3 and whatever, at some point you need to clean up old images and if you are unlucky you're going to remove an old image that is still in use somewhere. 
So that's, that's the thing that can happen as well. Also, some registries have pull quotas. For instance, the Docker Hub, which is probably the, the most like widely used registry, uh, at least for public base images that many of us are using. Uh, the Docker Hub will let you pull, I think it's 100 images every six hours per IP address, more or less. Um, personally, I almost never run into that because I'm just a small, humble freelancer hobbyist pulling containers. Uh, but some people use containers in bigger ways than I do and they run into that pretty often. So if you run into this uh, once in a while, uh, any of these reasons, then maybe Kubimage Keeper is going to make your container life a little bit nicer. Uh, also, it's pretty difficult to monitor for these specific conditions because, because as a kind of old school sysadmin, my first thought is, well, let's monitor that stuff so that we know when it's down. Uh, but you need to kind of dynamically add monitoring stuff for every single registry that you use and check if the images get deleted. This quickly goes uh, of, uh, out of hands, so we're not really doing that. Um, so also, if like me, you are an old school sysadmin, you might think, well, 25 years ago when I was installing Debian, I had a Debian mirror, so why can't we have a registry mirror? Uh, we kind of can, but because of early technical decisions in the whole architecture and protocol around registries, it's not easy to mirror registries. Uh, we could talk about that, but this is not the, the, the place and not the time. So. I'm going to talk about alternatives and including like mirroring a little bit later when I compare quick to other options. But long story short, we need something a little bit more advanced than that. Uh, and to give you like classic example that was almost the motivation for writing Kubimage Keeper. Uh, imagine you have a nice Kubernetes cluster, maybe you have like 20 nodes, everything is fine, and then you have a peak in traffic. So you have auto scaling that kicks in and does its job. And and uh, adds more pods to the cluster, and at some point you're out of capacity, so you are adding more nodes, and so you have more nodes in your cluster, but when these nodes come up, they are completely empty, they don't have images, uh, and so you need to pull these images, and if the images are not available, you are in this very sad scenario where you have a surge in traffic, you have the capacity, you, you are paying for extra nodes, but the nodes don't do anything because they don't have access to the images. All right, so we don't want that to happen. Um, so first demo, um, here I'm going, to, I'm going to reconnect to that machine here, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to just push um, some demo images that I'm going to delete later, spoiler alert. Uh, so my demo images are called burrito, taco, pizza, and sushi, which is fairly risky because we're close to lunchtime, so maybe some folks are going to run away during the talk because they're hungry. And I know what it is to be hungry because yesterday we took a 10 hours uh, car ride, a bus ride to get here, and they were like, we were not allowed to leave the bus during the stops, so it was pretty intense. Um, so anyway, um, I have a brand new Kubernetes cluster here, which I deployed like literally uh, this morning, uh, and I'm going to install a few things on it. Uh, so I have a few commands here that I'm going to copy paste uh, from a text file. The commands are in the slides, you know, so uh, uh, th this is the command I use to provision my cluster. It's using some custom scripts, but they are in a public GitHub repo just in case you're interested. Now here I'm installing um, Cert Manager and Quick itself. Tuk, tuk, tuk. Uh, Cert Manager is a dependency for Quick because we need to generate certificates and so instead of doing that in-house, we are outsourcing the job to Cert Manager and now I'm installing Quick itself. So I'm, I'm using uh, Helm here. Uh, if you are not, whoops, and of course I decided to skip the Prometheus installation, so that didn't quite work. Let me fix that. Um, if you're not familiar with Helm, you might won't be wondering, like, what, what are these kind of commands? What's going on here? Uh, Helm is basically a kind of package manager for uh, Kubernetes. So when you see me do some Helm install, Helm upgrade, that's the, the equivalent of doing an apt-get install or um install of some packages, except this is on a Kubernetes cluster. 
Uh, and I, yeah, if I don't press enter, it will never install. Uh, okay, so this is going to take a minute. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do um, after Quick is up and running, uh, I'm going to deploy uh, some uh, sushi and burrito, etc., on this cluster, uh, so that we have some workloads running. And so the the goal of the demo later will be to remove the images from the registry and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, in the meantime, if we go to the Docker Hub, uh, we're going to see what I have here. Yep, I have sushi, taco, burrito, pizza. Uh, I should see the last push. I thought we would, yeah, okay. I don't know. And uh, right, okay, Prometheus is installed and now Quick itself. There we go. Um, just FYI, the extra flags that you see me give like to this installation process, I'm telling Quick to not do its magic in cube system and default namespaces so that we can compare, you know, kind of with Quick and without Quick. Uh, and the extra flags that I'm putting here, that's to enable some Prometheus metrics gathering, which I will probably not have the time to demo, but just in case. Okay, so now hopefully we have, um, we should have, uh, uh, let's see, I have a K9S here, which is a nice way to have an overview. Okay, everything is not green, but blue, but everything is running. So quick is up and running, awesome. So now I can get some workloads on my cluster. Uh, so I'm going to uh, make that a little bit bigger and copy paste a couple of comments here. Uh, so I'm just creating uh, four deployments. So I have sushi and pizza in the default namespace and burrito and taco in the cantina namespace. Uh, so within, within a brief moment, we should see, yep, uh, running, 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 perfect. Okay, uh, so right. Now, how does quick work? Uh, well, if I take a look, uh, at the pods in the default namespace. Uh, let's see. You can see that I'm using images uh, jpetadzo demo sushi and jpetadzo demo pizza. All right. Now, if I go to the cantina namespace, which is protected by Quick, so to speak, uh, and I look at these pods, you can see that now uh, these images references are localhost 7439 jpetadzo demo burrito. So instead of pulling like straight from the registry, we are pulling from localhost 7439. What is on localhost 7439? Well, this is what we have now on the cluster. So you can see we have Quick Proxy and Quick Controller and Quick Registry. So uh, that thing on localhost 7439, that's the quick proxy. It's running as a daemon set, which means it's running on every node of the cluster, and it's, as the name implies, it's going to be a proxy to access registries. So the, the image references have been automatically rewritten by a mutating webhook which runs in the quick controller. So each time we create a pod, that webhook is like, wait a minute, let's rewrite the image reference here, and now the image reference goes to the local quick proxy. And now when you hit the, the local quick proxy, it, it, it's going to check if we have the image in the quick registry, which is basically just a cache. If we have the image, awesome, let's serve it. If we don't have the image, we fall back to the upstream registry. And then in parallel to that, we have the controller that's going to uh, get the images from the registry and put them in the quick registry. That's how it works, and uh, normally when I show that, I get various reactions. Some folks have been telling me, well, that seems way too simple in a way. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the beauty of it. It's not too complicated. Yes, we have multiple moving parts, and there is some stuff going on, but it's not rocket science, if I could say. Uh, now, some uh, downsides maybe, or you know, like to give you immediately the fine print, the, the catch. Uh, when you pull an image, the first time it's going to be pulled twice. Uh, once directly from the registry, and another time because we need to put it in 
the cache. So it's going to put a little bit of extra traffic on the registry, but you kind of recover that down the line because if you scale up or add more nodes or whatever, now you're going to pull from the local registry instead of going upstream. Another kind of problem is that if you use image pool policy always, which means you know always pull from the registry, it's not going to quite work the same because yes, it's going to always pull the image, but instead of pulling it from the upstream registry, it's going to pull from the quick registry, like from the cache. So if you rely, you know, on, on using tag latest or prod or something like that, and on image pool policy always, that might be a small issue. Although some folks would argue that maybe that, that's not a best practices thing to do. You know, you should not rely on image pool policy always because reasons, but still, I want to warn you, yep, if you're using that, that might be an issue. Now some details, uh, we have a CRD, uh, so um, a custom resource uh, to represent the cached images. So each time that the webhook detects, oh, a new image, it's going to create an entry here, and that's what the controller uses to feed the cache. Uh, what we see here, that's a reference count, so that's how quick tracks if you're using images or not, and once an image is not in use anymore, it's kept like 30 days and eventually it gets, oops, sorry, eventually it gets removed once again because uh, disk space is not infinite, so eventually we need to, to, to remove that. All right, so now what I'm going to do on the Docker Hub, I'm going to delete all these images except sushi because I love sushi and uh, delete the images, okay. Uh, all right, all I have now is sushi, which is fine with me. Uh, and now I'm going to um, kind of scale things up a little bit. Uh, so first, I'm going to um, tell Kubernetes, hey, my uh, sushi, burrito, pizza, etc. they need one gig of RAM to run. I'm doing that because later I'm going to scale up and I want to trigger like a, a cluster scaling event. All right, now that I have done that, let's have a look. Uh, is everything still fine? Yes, everything is running perfect. Okay, now let's scale things up a little bit and that's when uh, the problems should start. So scale everything to two replicas. There we go. Okay. Uh, and now let's look at our pods. And yep, I, so I like how K9S is using colors so I can directly see we have an air image pool here. So what's going on here is that uh, for pizza, uh, now I have a, a new pizza pod on the node that was not running uh, pizza before. Uh, so that, that node can't pull uh, the, the pizza image, so I got air image pool. Sushi is fine because I did not remove sushi from the Docker Hub. And uh, where is the cantina? A little bit above. Oh, so in the cantina, we have an interesting scenario. We have pending pods. Pending, so that means that the scheduler is still waiting, is still making a decision about where to put these pods. And here, basically, what we have is uh, uh, the, the Kubernetes cluster is full, like there is no more capacity for my pods. Um, and so that's going to trigger a cluster auto-scaling event. If I use describe on, uh, on this pod, uh, you can see at the bottom, let me zoom that a little bit. Um, so first I have a message from the scheduler telling me, hey, you don't have enough memory on the cluster. And just after that, we have the cluster auto-scaler that's basically telling me, I got you, I'm going to add more nodes to your cluster so that we can run that pod. And that typically takes a few minutes. Uh, oh, that was fast. So we can see we already have a third node which was just added like 15 seconds ago. It's not ready yet, but now it is. It's just the time you know, to run all the daemon sets and whatnot. And so if we take a look, let's go back here and uh, uh, it's okay if you can't read the small print. What's interesting is to see that we have a few orange lines here and there. So we have a few problems apparently. Uh, and if we go and have a closer look, uh, we can see, 
in the cantina here, we had uh, air image pool for a brief moment and now it's running. Okay, so what did just happen here? This is another, I would say, small limitation in Quick. Uh, basically, when the new node comes up, immediately it's going to try to run my burrito and taco images, and it's going to get them from localhost 7 something, so from the Quick proxy, but at that point, the Quick proxy is not up and running yet. So there is maybe, a, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds window when the node tries to start things and it does doesn't work because the proxy is not up yet, but after these 10, 20 seconds, the proxy is up. Kubernetes, or rather the kubelet, or technically, I guess, the container engine, retries the pool. Uh, this time it works and everything comes up. But what that means, you know, if we're really picky, if you try to optimize as much as possible container startup time, you could say, hmm, quick is kind of wasting me 10 or 20 seconds. I don't know if I like that. On the other hand, the pools happen from a local registry, so you might save a little bit of time thanks to that. It, you know, depends. Uh, but I guess it's good to be aware of that limitation. All right. So uh, now that we saw like, you know, quick, like basic uh, functioning, like in, in action, let's compare that to other options because, of course, before writing quick, we did our homework. Uh, or maybe I should say we tried to see if we really had to write some code or if maybe someone else did it before. So one thing you can do is set up a registry pull through cache. So this is a little bit like a good old fashioned uh, HTTP proxy. Um, there is a small problem that only works for the Docker Hub. I'm not going to dive into the technical reasons why, but yeah, on, that only works on the Docker Hub. Uh, and also it requires a little bit of tinkering with the container engine configuration. Uh, you need to go you know, to your uh, docker.json or daemon.json JSON uh, or whatever the equivalent is with container D or cryo, etc., to say, hey, I want to use this particular uh, registry proxy uh, or cache or mirror, etc. Okay, so since some folks use images that are not on the Docker Hub, this is not the universal option that we were looking for. The next one is to use a full featured registry, something like Harbor, for instance, as a proxy cache. And you can absolutely do that. Uh, you can set up um, some kind of namespace in Harbor and you say, hey, all the stuff here is actually going to mirror that registry over there. And then you rewrite your image references, just like we did with Quick. Uh, and you can even set up a webhook to that automatically for you, just like what Quick does. The only downside, uh, well, actually two downsides. The first one uh, is that you need to set that up for each registry that you use. So you have something on Docker Hub and DHCR and GCR and Quay and your internal registry, etc., etc. Each time you will need to set something up in Harbor. And the other thing is that the Harbor setup is a little bit more involved. It's, it's not super complicated by any means, but to the best of my knowledge, if you want to run Harbor, you're going to need like legit TLS certificates, which means uh, some domain name and probably an ingress controller. It's definitely not a one-liner like I did with, with Quick in the beginning of that talk. Uh, and, and again, some folks might like, uh, Harbor is, is great, like don't get me wrong, it's pretty awesome and we use it on a bunch of clusters, but if you need that just to have uh, a proxy cache for your registry, maybe that's a little bit too much. Uh, okay, so next option, there is a project called Cube Fledged, and that one is pretty awesome. I think, I mean, the, the vibe I got from uh, looking at the documentation, I feel like this is used on cruise ships uh, or maybe later like even spaceships or whatever, or anyway, in air-gapped environments, like when you don't have permanent connection to internet. And the idea of Cube Fledged is that it's going to pre-pull images on your nodes. But, there is a but, you have to make a list. You have to say, this is my nodes, this is the images I want to pre-pull, and then it's going to take care of it. It does it really well. Uh, it talks directly to the container engine. Um, but again, if the registry is down, it can't pull images. So I'm sure that for, for the folks who wrote it, I'm sure it's the perfect solution that they needed. But for us, that was not quite it. 
Another thing is the Kubernetes image pooler. Uh, and it's pretty similar to Kube Fledged. Uh, same thing, like you give it a list of images that you want to cache, and it's going to use a very low-tech solution for that. It's going to create a daemon set, uh, and if you want to have 20 images in cache, it's going to, you know, in that daemon set, you have a pod with 20 containers, each of these containers using one of the images you wanted. I say pretty low-tech in the sense that there is no CRD, there is no operator, there is no, um, you know, like weird thing talking directly to the container engine or whatever. Uh, so I say low tech here, you know, it's, it's not a criticism, it's more like a praise, like it's something that's fairly easy to understand and reason with, uh, so some folks might actually like that. But again, it doesn't have its own registry, so if the registry is down, it doesn't help you. If you know about other projects that let you have your own, you know, like fix this registry availability issues, uh, please, please let me know because I would be more than happy to add them here. And who knows, you know, if you have a solution that's way better than quick, maybe we can just scrap the whole thing and use the other project instead. Um, so, which of all these options is the best? Well, you might think I'm going to tell you, oh, obviously, Quick is the best solution, but not necessarily. It depends what you're trying to do. It depends on the, the problem that you're trying to solve. Our particular problem is registry availability, and for that, Quick is great, but for other problems, maybe you want something else. And by the way, when I say uh, we here, I'm being the... Um, uh, kind of the, 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 how do you say, the mouthpiece, the speaker uh, for the quick maintainers and, and the team behind that. They are like a service company managing hundreds of Kubernetes clusters and there is a bit of everything. There is on cloud, there is on premises, there is many different cloud providers, many different ways to install and manage Kubernetes. Um, so the, the reason why they wrote that is because it really solved that problem for them. All right, now we also have high availability in Quick, and uh, let's see if I can uh, show that one. Um, so what I'm going to do is first enable high availability, and there are two steps for that. The first one is to create a secret, which is going to be used by Minayo, and the second one is to kind of flip a switch uh, in the Quick installation, and I'm going to to do that, and this is going to take a little while, so I wanted to start that first, and now I'm going to explain what's going on here. Um, the, the key thing is here, like MinIO enable true, so the quick registry, like the, the cache where we store the images, that's just like the normal, uh, very basic Docker registry, uh, which means that you can deploy it in many different ways. You could use local storage, like in the container itself, which is great because you don't need any configuration, uh, but if you lose that container or that pod, you lose the content of that cache and you need to repopulate it. Or you can back the registry with something like S3 or any other kind of object store. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. Um, Minayo is used here as an S3 compatible object store. And behind this uh, very simple looking innocent little flag, what we're doing is that we're adding a whole dependency on Minayo. And if I go back to my, uh, uh, to, to my dashboard here, uh, sorry for the whole zoom and zoom. I hope this is not giving anyone seasickness. Um, but you can see that now we have a bunch of Minayo pods. We have a Minayo provisioning pod, which, okay, uh, this, this one is going to crash a few times, but eventually it's going to work. I'm still going to get like a piece of grape to appease the demo gods, just in case. Mm -hmm. But eventually that should work. Uh, and by the way, if, you, if you're running, let's say, on AWS and you want to use S3 for the backend, for the registry, you absolutely can do that. Here I just wanted to have something that's entirely self-contained. And I wanted to also kind of uh, show off like, look, you just have like this couple of commands and now you have uh, high availability, which I think is pretty neat. Um, but let's give it a minute. 
And uh, yeah, we'll have to wait until it's actually up and running before I can uh, demo the high availability part. So I'm going to move to Cube Builder. And although I, I don't think I saw any hand raised when I asked who's here because I want to know about Cube Builder, uh, I'm still going to talk about it, but I'm going to go like straight to the point and not bore you with the useless details. So Cube Builder is a framework um, to write uh, Kubernetes operators uh, because writing Kubernetes operators, it's kind of daunting. Like there is the whole control loop and CRD, so you need to write a bunch of YAMLs just for the CRDs. Uh, we could roughly compare that, you know, to uh, writing your own memory allocator. Uh, and some of us might have done that in their CS studies decades ago. Uh, or if you're working on a very exotic embedded platform or whatever. Uh, but nowadays, it's really rare that we would like write a memory allocator by hand. So same thing with Kubernetes operators. We're going to use a framework to help us as much as possible. Uh, first, uh, Cube Builder is not the only option. There are many others. Uh, for instance, Kopf is kind of uh, Python centric. Uh, Kudo is YAML centric, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not going to give you an intro to Cube Builder because I'm not the right person for that, and that would take more than a few minutes. And there are already lots of amazing resources about that, so I put a few links here. Uh, these videos here are fairly old, like three years, but they are still relevant, and that's the one I used back when I wanted to learn Cube Builder, so I can promise that that's the good stuff. Um, so instead, I'm going to give you kind of pros and cons of Cube Builder, especially the stuff that we didn't know when we got started. Uh, so first, there is lots of documentation. It's relatively easy to get started, uh, and phases on relatively because you know when we say, "Oh, it's easy," it's like, well, it's easy for whom? Like the the principal staff senior engineers with 50 years of Kubernetes experience, uh, or the person just like fresh out of school who's still maybe struggling a little bit with their shell? No, if you have basic knowledge of Go and Kubernetes, you will be able to get started with Kuben with uh, Kube Builder. I would say in a few hours, you, you will have your first controller up and running. And when I, when I teach kind of advanced Kubernetes classes about writing controllers, we use KubeBuilder. And to be clear, I'm, I'm not a good Go programmer, and I still manage to get that working. Uh, there is also the KubeBuilder uh, channel on the Kubernetes Slack where folks are extremely helpful and, and nice, uh, so that helps a lot. Uh, Cube Builder uh, helps a lot so when to maintain the, the CRDs, the custom resources. Uh, to give you a concrete example, uh, so this is for the cached images. So the idea is that you write uh, your structure, like as a Go structure, you put these annotations here indicating how that's going to translate to JSON and by extension to YAML. And then you have a bunch of magic comments like this that are going to be detected by Cube Builder builder uh, to generate the extra information uh, in the CRD YAML. So for instance, that's how you determine what's going to be shown when you do, you know, the kubectl get cached images. So in the CRD YAML, there is information about these columns, for instance. Okay, uh, so, so that helps a lot because, I mean, uh, CRD manifests are hundreds, sometimes thousands of lines of YAML, and I don't think anyone wants to maintain that by hand. I mean, unless that's your thing, then of course, but uh, most folks don't really enjoy that. Uh, well, since in the meantime, I think, um, I think everything is green or, well, blue, kind of. Well, except that one here, that's the, the pizza image. Um, so now that, we, now that we have high availability, I'm going to uh, push my images again to the Docker Hub because when we switched to high availability, like disclaimer, that wiped out uh, the, the cache that we had. So I need to repopulate that cache. So first I'm going to push my images again. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, scale things up a little bit. Uh, what's the command that I was intending to use? Probably scale, yeah, three replicas. Uh, no, actually. 
Um, <laughs> all right, okay, I'm going to use a little hack here to force a repool of the images. I'm just putting an annotation on these cached images and that forces the quick controller to look at them again and refresh the cache. And I think if I uh, quick system controllers, uh, if we do that, we can see the logs of the quick controller and I see, yes, cached, cached, cached. All right, my images are now probably, hopefully, in the cache. Uh, so I can move to the next step, which is to delete the images from the registry one more time. So that's going to be essentially the same demo as earlier, but with a twist. And the twist is that, well, you know what, this time I'm just going to delete everything, even though I'm sure everybody is getting fairly hungry. And then let's scale things up, uh, but to like uh, three replicas, okay? Uh, and then we're going to wait a little bit until everything comes up. And then I'm just going to delete a node. Uh, actually, maybe I could go ahead and do that right away and we'll see what happens. Let's pick uh, not the node where my shell is running, because that would be very unfortunate. Okay, let's do a get pods like this. So, uh, dash O wide maybe. Uh, and I should have had a command to facilitate that. So, my shell is running on node, uh, what is it, 3, 2, E6, etc., etc. Now, the quick controller is running on... Doo -doo -doo. Um, let's pick that one, 3A6F, okay, so I'm going to do uh, 3A6F, all right, uh, all right, that, okay, and now uh, delete 3A6F, this, that one, okay. and uh, we'll see what happens. And I, the only thing I hope is that I did not somehow delete the node through which the SSH connection is going, uh, but uh, uh, which might be what I just did, so let me reconnect. It's, it's all right, it's all right, I can reconnect. I just need to find the IP address. Okay, I think I can connect here. Um, don't panic. Keep calm and SSH on. Um, okay, so let's replace that IP address here and reconnect. Yes, Tmux attach, and we're back in business. Told you, no, no reason to panic. Everything is fine under control, uh, except the timing. I think we have two minutes left. Uh, by the way, if there are folks watching through the live stream, uh, feel free to start sending your questions now because there is like a 30 seconds in the live stream. So if, if, if I say, do you have questions and you start sending them at that point, I'm going to get that like much later. So, um, okay, the, the cluster is going to do a little, no, there we go, okay. Awesome. Uh, so I want to see all pods, please. Um, so we can see there is a bunch of things that are not right. I don't know if everyone can read on the screen, but that's okay. All that matters is the, the colors and everything that is in yellow, orange, red means bad. Uh, so we can see that in the default namespace, things are not going well because we excluded that namespace from Quick's processing. So Quick is not doing anything with that namespace. Now in the Cantina namespace, uh, we have Taco, which is pending here. That one, we have an image pull back off, uh, but there we go, now it's running. This is the little glitch I was telling you earlier, like when the node comes up, there is a little window in time when Quick hasn't come up yet, and so things don't quite work, but eventually Quick starts and then everything is nice and peachy. And this one is going to take a few more minutes uh, because I think the cluster is provisioning a new node at the moment. Um, but if we look, for instance, at the MinIO pods, which are in a quick system, so you can see the slightly different kind of blue here. That's one of the MinIO pods, which 
went down uh, when I took down the node. And that one is also going to take a few minutes to come back because I think there is a persistent volume attached to that. So it's going to take a minute, but that's fine because the whole point of MinIO is that it's using, I think, um, er erasure coding error correction. I don't know if I put the words in the right uh, order, uh, but basically we have redundancy and we can lose a couple of MinIO pods without disturbing uh, everything. All right, so that kind of worked. Uh, back to wrap up on, um, on Cube Builder. Uh, who here tests their code? Okay, uh, so for the heroes out there, uh, Cube Builder has some really nice testing facilities uh, because we, you want to test against the Kubernetes cluster, but you don't want to start the whole thing, so it has something to start just a basic control plane, and then you can run your test against that, and you can decide exactly which uh, version you want to use, so that's pretty nice. Now, I'm going to give you the, the real uh, kind of uh, not so great thing with Kube Builder. It's for version upgrades. So let's say that a new Kubernetes version comes out and you're like, okay, I want to support that fully. So you might have to update a few like Go package imports and things like that. Uh, and either you do that manually, which is annoying and fastidious, or uh, you get Cube Builder to do it for you. And at this point today, like it cannot do that yet. Cube Builder generates lots of code for you. And you can generate the new version of the code, but then you will have to do the merge yourself uh, with, your, with your code. So currently, we, you know, we have like, a, I don't remember the exact name of the command, but something like kubebuilder generate a bunch of stuff, but we don't have kubebuilder upgrade the bunch of stuff that you generated earlier, unfortunately. That being said, uh, so some uh, quotes from the quick maintainers who've been working with Cube Builder when and I have. Uh, they, they told me, well, it's not perfect, but it's still a huge help and saved us a lot of time. And I think the key point, you know, I asked them, well, if you had like a crystal ball back then when you started, uh, and, and if you had known all that, would you still have used Cube Builder? And they were like, yes, absolutely. Uh, because even, even if it's not perfect, it's still way better than nothing. Uh, and, and they got like lots of uh, good things from it. All right. So at this point, yep, now all the MinIO pods recovered. Um, so that was the, the HA part of the demo. And it's kind of nice because we can see that the normal pods are completely, like they went completely belly up, uh, but everything in the Cantina namespace is still up, which is pretty amazing because I think it's lunchtime. Uh, and that's all I got. Thanks a lot. We're kind of out of time, but I'm still going to try to get maybe a couple of questions, especially since there is nobody in this room after. Um, first, I see one question online, maybe. How do I describe the retention for the persistent storage? Uh, great question. So the persistent storage here would be the storage used by the quick registry. And here, uh, I, I just use like a big switch, which is a high availability on. And that enabled MinIO and enabled a bunch of configuration for MinIO, et cetera, et cetera. So if we wanted to change the, the, the retention policies uh, for the persistent storage, uh, we would have to go in there. And since Quick is using, I think it's the Bitnami MinIO Helm chart, uh, you, you can just uh, pass some Helm parameters to that uh, and, and, and adjust that. So if you want to change the number of replicas, the number of of MinIO pods, all that kind of stuff, uh, you can do that uh, there. Or you could switch to a real S3 uh, bucket with whatever settings you want. And finally, if the question was about how long do the images stay there, I don't remember on the top of my head how you set it, but I'm pretty sure it's in the quick Elm chart as well. Uh, and one last thing, uh, we, all, we often say, hey, we, we should thank uh, open source maintainers. So 
I wanted to thank the two uh, main maintainers of the quick project, uh, Paul and David, uh, who gave me lots of input when preparing this, that presentation. Uh, I tried to drag one of them here to speak with me, but uh, they were still feeling a little bit too shy for that. Uh, but I hope we can get them to, to do that at, at some point in the future, because I think it's a really cool project. Thanks, and do you have questions? Yes? Um, for optimizing image pull, did you consider um, uh, like those lazy pulling uh, techniques? Uh, did we consider lazy pulling techniques? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that would mean. Like, I mean, there's in container D like experimental snapshotters like star GZ, nice. uh, which only pull the bits that you actually. Use? Okay, uh, I haven't looked into that yet, but I think I see what you mean, like, and, and that's pretty exciting, uh, but I, I think it would complement pretty nicely with that, because at the end of the day, uh, once you really need to pull a layer or a bit of an image, you, you need that registry to be up and running, uh, and so I think Quick might still play a role here. Now, to be honest, I don't know at all how that part works. I see that Phil is here, so maybe I'm going to ask him a few questions about that after. Uh, so if that means a different OCI format where we don't have layers anymore, uh, then it means that we will need to see how to support that, of course, and I, I think we would absolutely want to, to support it. Um, some of the limitations I mentioned, you know, like, oh, you pull twice and uh, uh, the, the image pull policy always, uh, we are trying to see how to address that. And we also have some first contributions from the community as well. Uh, so um, that's definitely something I'm going to keep on top of my head. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. What happens if the quick proxy image couldn't be pulled, and where is that pulled from? Excellent question. So basically, who pulls the pullers? <laughs> um, so at this point, I think it's on GHCR, but I'm not 100% sure. So let's have a quick look. Haha, <laughs> a quick look. <clears throat> that was not on purpose. Uh, describe image, 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 image. Uh, my bad, it's on the Docker Hub, um, and so there is, there is definitely something to do here. So I think, if I remember correctly, uh, the, the, what we do on production clusters is that we are still using a registry mirror specifically for stuff on the Docker Hub, uh, so that basically uh, we can still pull that and a few essential images, you know, like uh, here we're using Calico, uh, which I think is maybe not on the Docker Hub, but the idea is make sure that the basic stuff is, well, either on the Docker Hub or somewhere else, and then set up like one registry mirror for that uh, pool of images, and then we are good for everything else. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I, and I think I've also seen some some uh, discussions around like baking these images in the, um, you know, the VM image used to spin up the clusters. I've I have not looked too deep into that because I don't like to bake custom images, maybe because I still have bad experiences from doing it a decade ago, uh, but that's also an option. Yeah. Makes sense, but I mean, it seems very bad if you can't put that image, right? Yeah. All right, well, if there are no other questions, thanks again, and now let's all have a taco, burrito, or whatever is at the cantina. <laughs> Thank you.